The moment you use water in the bathroom and suddenly experience an electric shock, your circuit breaker is useless. That's because a standard breaker is designed to detect overloads, not the low magnitude current that actually puts you in danger. But danger is only half the story. When temperatures drop close to minus 10 degrees, many water heaters start to fail in a different way. Efficiency collapses, energy losses rise sharply, and performance becomes unreliable. All of these risks begin at the point where energy changes its form. Let's start with the gas water heater. A gas-fired water heater works almost like a boiler. At the top, there is a heat exchanger, which is generally made of copper for better heat transfer, and water pipes are wrapped around it in a loop. Here, the source of heat is propane or natural gas. The gas is supplied to the burner, and as soon as it reaches it, the flame is ignited through an igniter. These flames reach the heat exchanger, where the plates installed inside begin to heat up. This heat spreads throughout the heat exchanger and is then transferred to the water flowing through the loops, thereby heating the water. However, there is one important point to understand here. The entire energy of the flames does not reach the water. A significant amount of energy is lost and escapes directly to the outside. This is why the efficiency of gas-fired water heaters remains only around 60 to 70%. Although gas-fired water heaters are equipped with sensors and controllers, they are still considered the most unsafe type of water heater. If a unit is installed inside a bathroom, the combustion of gas produces carbon monoxide, and the flames also consume oxygen, which makes staying inside the bathroom for long periods risky. In addition, propane and natural gas themselves are highly dangerous, and in case of leakage, the risk increases further. Moreover, in areas where temperatures fall below zero degrees, gas supply performance can degrade, causing gas-fired water heaters to struggle. Because of this, electric water heaters entered the market as the second unsafe option. They can operate at 90 to 98% efficiency, and regardless of how low the temperature is, they work properly, as long as the water remains in liquid form and does not freeze. If we open an electric water heater and examine it, the first thing we see is a metallic outer casing. Inside this casing, there is foam, which acts as a heat shield and traps the heat inside after the water has been heated. After removing the foam, a mild steel tank becomes visible inside, where the water is heated. The first thing that draws your attention is the heating element installed at the bottom. If this heating element is taken out, it looks exactly like a simple electric immersion heating element. However, inside a water heater, it is installed with proper safety measures, and the important point to understand here is why it is made in a coil shape instead of being straight. If we open this coil and examine it, there is a thin nichrome alloy wire inside it. Around this wire, magnesium oxide powder is packed. This nichrome alloy is also arranged in a coil shape. When electrical supply is connected to both ends of this coil, it begins to heat up. However, if the same coil is made of copper or aluminium and supply is applied, it will also heat up, but sparking will occur and a fault will develop because the phase and neutral get directly connected. In the case of nichrome alloy, the connection is similar, but instead of sparking, it generates heat. The biggest reason behind this is resistance. If a metal has higher resistance, it does not allow current to flow easily, which causes the temperature of the wire to rise. The higher the resistance, the higher the temperature of the wire. Nichrome alloy provides high resistance, and to further increase resistance, it is formed into loops, increasing its length and therefore increasing resistance even more. Nichrome alloy can withstand very high temperatures. In contrast, copper and aluminium provide very low resistance, which is why they are used in household wiring, so that electricity is not wasted as heat, but is used for actual work. Now, as an example, imagine placing this same heating element directly inside a water heater, filling it with water, and switching the unit on. You will notice that the water heats up, but the moment you touch the water, you will receive a severe electric shock. The current enters from this side and reaches this point. From here, the current needs to pass through the coil, but since the resistance of the wire is very high, the current takes a shortcut and completes its path directly through the water. 
some current still continues to flow through the coil, which is why the water keeps heating as well. And exactly the same thing happens inside a water heater. In reality, the nichrome alloy is placed inside a steel tube, and magnesium oxide is packed around it so that the coil does not touch the body of the tube. However, after some time, minerals present in the water start depositing on this metallic tube and form a strong layer, which is called scale. Because of scaling, this layer does not allow the heat of the heating element to escape outward, due to which the nichrome wire inside becomes excessively hot. This cycle keeps repeating. As scaling increases, the water takes more time to heat up, which causes the nichrome alloy to remain hot for a longer duration, and cracks start developing in the outer tube. Through these cracks, water enters inside. As soon as water reaches inside, it finds a direct path for current, and current spreads throughout the entire water. Now safety can also be provided for this. If you look at the pins of the water heater, the third pin is connected to the body of the unit. If this third pin is connected to proper grounding, the extra current flows directly into the ground. In this case, even if a small amount of current is present in the water, you may feel it, but it will not be dangerous enough to become a risk to life. Inside the water heater, a thermostat is installed within the tube, which continuously monitors the temperature of the water. When the water temperature reaches around 60 to 70 degrees, it switches off the heating element. Basically, a thermostat contains two metallic strips, such as brass and steel, which expand at different rates at different temperatures. When heated, one metal expands more and the other expands less, causing the strip to bend to one side and start loading a spring. Due to the heat of the water inside the water heater, this metallic strip bends, pulls the mechanism, and disconnects the circuit which turns the water heater off. As soon as the water cools down, the strip returns to its original position. The connection is restored, and the water heater turns on again. However, a thermostat is a device, and it can fail. If it does not switch off the heating element, the water will start turning into steam, pressure inside the tank will increase, and the water heater can even burst. That is why a pressure relief valve is installed near the inlet valve. As soon as the pressure increases, this valve gets pushed and water starts flowing out. Understand one important point. When water is cold, its molecules remain close to each other. As soon as they receive energy, they start vibrating, spread apart, and their density decreases. The cold water present at the top has a higher density, meaning it is heavier, so it starts moving downward. And because hot water has a lower density, it rises upward in the same way as water heats up, it moves upward. This is why the outlet pipe is installed at the top, so that hot water can continuously flow out. You may have noticed that the incoming water line is bent in a specific way. This prevents the cold water coming from outside from mixing with the hot water at the top. The second point is that the water heater always remains filled with water because operating the heating element without water can be extremely dangerous. Keeping this safety aspect in mind, solar water heaters entered the market. In a solar water heater, heat energy obtained from sunlight is transferred directly to the water. Here, energy is not converted from one form to another. If we take out one tube of this solar water heater and examine it, we find two layers inside it, both made of borosilicate glass. The outer layer is strong enough to withstand rain, heat, and cold, while still allowing sunlight to pass through easily. Between these two layers, there is a vacuum, which traps the heat energy received from sunlight inside. This tube is completely sealed and is open only from one side for the entry and exit of water. Fins installed at the bottom distribute the heat energy properly throughout the tube. Due to the vacuum, Light energy reaches the inner layer. Since the inner layer is filled with water, the heat energy received from sunlight is transferred directly to the water. Glass allows heat to enter, but it is not as good a conductor as metal. Therefore, a thin layer of aluminium or copper is applied on top of the inner layer. As soon as sunlight falls on this layer, electrons begin to vibrate due to the energy, and because of the high conductivity of the metal, its temperature rises. This heat passes through the glass to the water, and the water begins to heat up. 
This metallic layer also prevents the heat of the water from escaping back outside. Because of the vacuum, this tube is called an evacuated tube collector. It can heat water up to 60 to 70 degrees and works effectively even in weak sunlight because it traps whatever heat it receives inside. Using this heat, water gets heated and continuously collects in the tank. If you have noticed, this system is almost safe. However, in countries where temperatures are extremely low, water inside the tube can freeze. In such cases, the tube design remains the same. But instead of water, a copper or aluminium pipe is placed inside the tube. This pipe is filled with an alcohol-based or refrigerant-based liquid that does not freeze, allowing it to work even at temperatures as low as minus 15 degrees. This is called evacuated tube collector heat pipe technology. When sunlight falls on this liquid, it heats up and turns into vapor, which rises upward and reaches the tank. Around this pipe inside the tank, there is water, which gets heated, while the liquid loses its heat and starts cooling down. As soon as it cools, it turns back into liquid, flows downward, and then heats up again due to sunlight and rises upward. In this way, the cycle continues in a closed loop. ETC solar water heaters can operate at approximately 70 to 80% efficiency. But if you're looking for the absolute gold standard in safety and efficiency, you need to look at heat pumps. If you observe an air conditioner carefully, we usually associate it only with room cooling. But in reality, an air conditioner can also work as an excellent water heater and space heater, with an efficiency of 300 to 400 percent. And it can operate at temperatures as low as minus 10 degrees. And the most interesting part is that you can convert your air conditioner into a heater almost free of cost. An air conditioner has a condenser unit outside and an evaporator coil inside. If the condenser unit is placed inside the room and the evaporator coil is placed outside, your heater is ready. I am not joking. Heat pumps work on exactly this principle. First, the compressor pumps the refrigerant, which increases its pressure and temperature. This heated refrigerant is passed through the condenser unit, and if water is present around the condenser, it gets heated easily. When the refrigerant transfers its heat to the water through the condenser, it turns back into liquid. This liquid then moves towards the evaporator unit, where an expansion valve is installed. As the refrigerant passes through the expansion valve, its temperature can drop to as low as minus 20 degrees. If the outside temperature is minus 10 degrees, the evaporator extracts 10 degrees of heat from the surroundings, causing the refrigerant to turn back into gas. After this, the refrigerant returns to the compressor, where pressure again raises its temperature. In this way, the cycle continues continuously. Water can be heated through the condenser, and the system can also function as a space heater. However, there is one more idea. Without changing either the condenser or the evaporator, we can still operate an air conditioner in both heating and cooling modes by making a few simple changes. If there is a request for this in the comment box, then in the next video, we will discuss this topic in detail. I hope you have now gained a clear understanding of all types of water heaters. If there is any confusion, make sure to write it in the comment box. Thank you.